This is section 120 of Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Newspaper Articles by Mark Twain, section 120, The Galaxy, November 1870, part 1. The Galaxy, November 1870. Mark Twain's Map of Paris. I published my Map of the Fortifications of Paris in my own paper a fortnight ago, but am obliged to reproduce it in the galaxy to satisfy the extraordinary demand for it which has arisen in military circles throughout the country. General Grant's outspoken commendation originated this demand, and General Sherman's fervent endorsement added fuel to it. The result is that tons of these maps have been fed to the suffering soldiers of our land, but without avail. They hunger still. We will cast the galaxy into the breach, and stand by and await the effect. The next Atlantic mail will doubtless bring news of a European frenzy for the map. It is reasonable to expect that the siege of Paris will be suspended till a German translation of it can be forwarded, it is now in preparation, and that the defense of Paris will likewise be suspended to await the reception of the French translation now progressing under my own hands, and likely to be unique. King William's high praise of the map, and Napoleon's frank enthusiasm concerning its execution, will ensure its prompt adoption in Europe, as the only authoritative and legitimate exposition of the present military situation. It is plain that if the Prussians cannot get into Paris with the facilities afforded by this production of mine, they ought to deliver the enterprise into abler hands. Strangers to me keep insisting that this map does not explain itself. One person came to me with bloodshot eyes and an harassed look about him, and shook the map in my face and said he believed I was some kind of idiot. I have been bussed a good deal by other quick-tempered people like him, who came with similar complaints. Now, therefore, I yield willingly, and, for the information of the ignorant, will briefly explain the present military situation as illustrated by the map. Part of the Prussian forces, under Prince Frederick William, are now boarding at the farmhouse in the margin of the map. There is nothing between them and Vincennes but a rail fence in bad repair. Any corporal can see at a glance that they have only to burn it, pull it down, crawl under, climb over, or walk around it, just as the commander-in-chief shall elect. Another portion of the Prussian forces are at Podunk, under von Moltke. They have nothing to do but float down the river Seine on a raft and scale the walls of Paris. Let the worshippers of that overrated soldier believe in him still, and abide the result, for me, I do not believe he will ever think of a raft. At Omaha and the High Bridge are vast masses of Prussian infantry, and it is only fair to say that they are likely to stay there, as that figure of a window-sash between them stands for a brewery. Away up out of sight over the top of the map is the fleet of the Prussian navy, ready at any moment to come caverting down the Erie Canal unless some new iniquity of an unprincipled legislature shall put up the tolls, and so render it cheaper to walk. To me, it looks as if Paris is in a singularly close place. She never was situated before, as she is in this map. Mark Twain To the reader. The accompanying map explains itself. The idea of this map is not original with me, but is borrowed from the Tribune and the other great metropolitan journals. I claim no other merit for this production, if I may so call it, than that it is accurate. The main blemish of the city paper maps, of which it is an imitation, is that in them more attention seems paid to artistic picturesqueness than geographical reliability. Inasmuch as this is the first time I ever tried to draft and engrave a map, or attempt anything in the line of art at all, the commendations the work has received, and the admiration it has excited among the people, have been very grateful to my feelings. And it is touching to reflect that by far the most enthusiastic of these praises have come from people who know nothing at all about art. By an unimportant oversight I have engraved the map so that it reads wrong end first, except to left-handed people. 
i forgot that in order to make it right in print it should be drawn and engraved upside down however let the student who desires to contemplate the map stand on his head or hold it before her looking-glass that will bring it right the reader will comprehend at a glance that that piece of river with the high bridge over it got left out to one side by reason of a slip of the engraving tool which rendered it necessary to change the entire course of the river rhine or else spoil the map after having spent two days in digging and gouging at the map i would have changed the course of the atlantic ocean before i would have lost so much work i never had so much trouble with anything in my life as i did with this map i had heaps of little fortifications scattered all around paris at first but every now and then my instruments would slip and fetch away whole miles of batteries and leave the vicinity as clean as if the prussians had been there the reader will find it well to frame this map for future reference so that it may aid in extending popular intelligence and dispelling the widespread ignorance of the day mark twain official commendations it is the only map of the kind i ever saw u s grant it places the situation in an entirely new light bismarck i cannot look upon it without shedding tears brigham young it is very nice large print napoleon my wife was for years afflicted with freckles and though everything was done for her relief that could be done all was in vain but sir since her first glance at your map they have entirely left her she has nothing but convulsions now j smith if i had had this map i could have got out of metz without any trouble bazin i have seen a great many maps in my time but none that this one reminds me of trochu it is but fair to say that in some respects it is a truly remarkable map w t sherman i said to my son frederick william if you could only make a map like that i would be perfectly willing to see you die even anxious william the third the galaxy november eighteen seventy memoranda by mark twain goldsmith's friend abroad again continued note no experience is set down in the following letters which had to be invented fancy is not needed to give variety to a chinaman's sojourn in america plain fact is amply sufficient letter five san francisco eighteen blank dear ching fu you will remember that i had just been thrust violently into a cell in the city prison when i wrote last i stumbled and fell on some one i got a blow and a curse and on top of these a kick or two and a shove in a second or two it was plain that i was in a nest of prisoners and was being passed around for the instant i was knocked out of the way of one i fell on the head or heels of another and was promptly ejected only to land on a third prisoner and get a new contribution of kicks and curses and a new destination i brought up at last in an unoccupied corner very much battered and bruised and sore but glad enough to be let alone for a little while i was on the flagstones for there was no furniture in the den except a long broad board or combination of boards like a barn door and this bed was accommodating five or six persons and that was its full capacity they lay stretched side by side snoring when not fighting one end of the board was four inches higher than the other and so the slant answered for a pillow there were no blankets and the night was a little chilly the nights are always a little chilly in san francisco though never severely cold the board was a deal more comfortable than the stones and occasionally some flagstone plebeian like me would try to creep to a place on it and then the aristocrats would hammer him good and make him think a flag pavement was a nice enough place after all i lay quiet in my corner stroking my bruises and listening to the revelations the prisoners made to each other and to me for some that were near me talked to me a good deal i had long had an idea that americans being free had no need of prisons which are a contrivance of despots for keeping restless patriots out of mischief so i was considerably surprised to find out my mistake ours was a big general cell it seemed 
for the temporary accommodation of all comers whose crimes were trifling. Among us there were two Americans, two greasers, Mexicans, a Frenchman, a German, four Irishmen, a Chilenian, and, in the next cell, only separated from us by a grating, two women, all drunk and all more or less noisy, and as night fell and advanced they grew more and more discontented and disorderly, occasionally shaking the prison bars and glaring through them at the slowly pacing officer, and cursing him with all their hearts. The two women were nearly middle-aged, and they had only had enough liquor to stimulate instead of stupefy them. Consequently, they would fondle and kiss each other for some minutes, and then fall to fighting and keep it up till they were just two grotesque tangles of rags and blood and tumbled hair. Then they would rest a while and pant and swear. While they were affectionate they always spoke of each other as ladies, but while they were fighting Strumpet was the mildest name they could think of, and they could only make that do by tacking some sounding profanity to it. In their last fight, which was toward midnight, one of them bit off the other's finger, and then the officer interfered and put the greaser into the dark cell to answer for it, because the woman that did it laid it on him, and the other woman did not deny it, because, as she said afterward, she wanted another crack at the hussy when her finger quit hurting, and so she did not want her removed. By this time those two women had mutilated each other's clothes to that extent that there was not sufficient left to cover their nakedness. I found that one of these creatures had spent nine years in the county jail, and that the other one had spent about four or five years in the same space. They had done it from choice. As soon as they were discharged from captivity, they would go straight and get drunk, and then steal some trifling thing while an officer was observing them. That would entitle them to another two months in jail. And there they would occupy clean, airy apartments, and have good food in plenty, and, being at no expense at all, they could make shirts for the clothiers at half a dollar apiece, and thus keep themselves in smoking tobacco and such other luxuries as they wanted. When the two months were up, they would go just as straight as they could walk to Mother Leonard's and get drunk, and from there to Kearney Street and steal something, and thence to the city prison, and next day back to the old quarters in the county jail again. One of them had really kept this up for nine years, and the other four or five, and both said they meant to end their days in that prison. Note, the former of the two did. Ed Mem. Finally, both these creatures fell upon me, while I was dozing with my head against their grating, and battered me considerably, because they discovered that I was a Chinaman, and they said I was a bloody interloping loafer come from the devil's own country to take the bread out of decent people's mouths, and put down the wages for work when it was all a Christian could do to keep body and soul together as it was. Loafer means one who will not work. Ah Sung He Letter 6. San Francisco, 18 blank. Dear Ching Fu, to continue, the two women became reconciled to each other again through the common bond of interest and sympathy created between them by pounding me in partnership, and when they had finished me they fell to embracing each other again and swearing more eternal affection like that which had subsisted between them all the evening, barring occasional interruptions they agreed to swear the finger-biting on the greaser in open court, and get him sent to the penitentiary for the crime of mayhem. Another of our country was a boy of fourteen who had been watched for some time by officers and teachers, and repeatedly detected in enticing young girls from the public schools to the lodgings of gentlemen downtown. He had been furnished with lures in the form of pictures and books of a peculiar kind, and these he had distributed among his clients. There were likenesses of fifteen of these young girls on exhibition, only to prominent citizens and persons in authority, it was said, though most people came to get a sight, at the police headquarters, but no punishment at all was to be inflicted on the poor little misses. The boy was afterward sent into captivity at the House of Correction for some months, and there was a strong disposition to punish the gentleman who had employed the boy to entice the girls but as that could not be done without making public the names of those gentlemen, and thus injuring them socially, the idea was finally given up. 
there was also in our cell that night a photographer a kind of artist who makes likenesses of people with a machine who had been for some time patching the pictured heads of well-known and respectable young ladies to the nude pictured bodies of another class of women then from this patched creation he would make photographs and sell them privately at high prices to rowdies and blackguards averring that these the best young ladies of the city had hired him to take their likenesses in that unclad condition what a lecture the police judge read that photographer when he was convicted he told him his crime was little less than an outrage he abused that photographer till he almost made him sink through the floor and then he fined him a hundred dollars and he told him he might consider himself lucky that he didn't fine him a hundred and twenty-five dollars they are awfully severe on crimes here about two or two and a half hours after midnight of that first experience of mine in the city prison such of us as were dozing were awakened by a noise of beating and dragging and groaning and in a little while a man was pushed into our den with a there damn you soak there a spell and then the gate was closed and the officers went away again the man who was thrust among us fell limp and helpless by the grating just as anybody could reach him with a kick without the trouble of hitching along toward him or getting fairly up to deliver it our people only grumbled at him and cursed him and called him insulting names for misery and hardship do not make their victims gentle or charitable toward each other but as he neither tried humbly to conciliate our people nor swore back at them his unnatural conduct created surprise and several of the party crawled to him where he lay in the dim light that came through the grating and examined into his case his head was very bloody and his wits were gone after about an hour he sat up and stared around then his eyes grew more natural and he began to tell how that he was going along with a bag on his shoulder and a brace of policemen ordered him to stop which he did not do was chased and caught beaten ferociously about the head on the way to the prison and after arrival there and finally thrown into our den like a dog and in a few seconds he sank down again and grew flighty of speech one of our people was at last penetrated with something vaguely akin to compassion maybe for he looked out through the gratings at the guardian officer pacing to and fro and said say mickey this shrimp's going to die stop your noise was all the answer he got but presently our man tried it again he drew himself to the gratings grasping them with his hands and looking out through them sat waiting till the officer was passing once more and then said sweetness you'd better mind your eye now because you beats have killed this cuss you've busted his head and he'll pass in his checks before sun-up you better go for a doctor now you bet you had the officer delivered a sudden rap on our man's knuckles with his club that sent him scampering and howling among the sleeping forms on the flagstones and an answering burst of laughter came from the half-dozen policemen idling about the rail desk in the middle of the dungeon but there was a putting of heads together out there presently and a conversing in low voices which seemed to show that our man's talk had made an impression and presently an officer went away in a hurry and shortly came back with the person who entered our cell and felt the bruised man's pulse and threw the glare of a lantern on his drawn face striped with blood and his glassy eyes fixed and vacant the doctor examined the man's broken head also and presently said if you'd called me an hour ago i might have saved this man maybe too late now then he walked out into the dungeon and the officers surrounded him and they kept up a low and earnest buzzing of conversation for fifteen minutes i should think and then the doctor took his departure from the prison several of the officers now came in and worked a little with the wounded man but toward daylight he died it was the longest longest night and when the daylight came filtering reluctantly into the dungeon at last it was the grayest dreariest saddest daylight and yet when an officer by and by turned off the sickly yellow gas flame and immediately the gray of dawn became fresh and white there was a lifting of my spirits that acknowledged and believed that the night was gone and straightway i fell to stretching my sore limbs and looking about me with a grateful sense of relief and a returning interest in life about me lay evidences that what seemed now a feverish dream and a nightmare 
was the memory of a reality instead for on the boards lay four frowsy ragged bearded vagabonds snoring one turned end for end and resting an unclean foot in a ruined stocking on the hairy breast of a neighbor the young boy was uneasy and lay moaning in his sleep other forms lay half revealed and half concealed about the floor in the furthest corner the gray light fell upon a sheet whose elevations and depressions indicated the places of the dead man's face and feet and folded hands and through the dividing bars one could discern the almost nude forms of the two exiles from the county jail twined together in a drunken embrace and sodden with sleep by and by all the animals in all the cages awoke and stretched themselves and exchanged a few cuffs and curses and then began to clamor for breakfast breakfast was brought in at last bread and beefsteak on tin plates and black coffee in tin cups and no grabbing allowed and after several dreary hours of waiting after this we were all marched out into the dungeon and joined there by all manner of vagrants and vagabonds of all shades and colors and nationalities from the other cells and cages of the place and pretty soon our whole menagerie was marched upstairs and locked fast behind a high railing in a dirty room with a dirty audience in it and this audience stared at us and at a man seated on high behind what they call a pulpit in this country and at some clerks and other officials seated below him and waited this was the police court the court opened pretty soon i was compelled to notice that a culprit's nationality made for or against him in this court overwhelming proofs were necessary to convict an irishman of crime and even then his punishment amounted to little frenchmen spaniards and italians had strict and unprejudiced justice meted out to them in exact accordance with the evidence negroes were promptly punished when there was the slightest preponderance of testimony against them but chinamen were punished always apparently now this gave me some uneasiness i confess i knew that this state of things must of necessity be accidental because in this country all men were free and equal and one person could not take to himself an advantage not accorded to all other individuals i knew that and yet in spite of it i was uneasy and i grew still more uneasy when i found that any succored and befriended refugee from ireland or elsewhere could stand up before that judge and swear away the life or liberty or character of a refugee from china but that by the law of the land the chinaman could not testify against the irishman i was really and truly uneasy but still my faith in the universal liberty that america accords and defends and my deep veneration for the land that offered all distressed outcasts a home and protection was strong within me and i said to myself that it would all come out right yet ah sung he end of section one twenty